What is going on, everyone? Welcome to another podcast here, and I'm excited to talk about this topic. Today on the podcast, my cousin's on vacation. He's in the Bahamas while I'm sitting here in South Jersey. Okay, It's not even fair, but we have Amadeo here to step in and talk some sports, and we have the NBA Finals to discuss. Last night, we had Game 1 of the NBA Finals, and... Uh, the the Warriors, in my opinion, kind of got dominated there, and then the Raptors stepped up big. They played defensively, which is what they've been doing all postseason long. They dominated defensively. Marcus Saul was a factor. Uh, Pascal Siakam with 32 points. The kid was truly special, and I don't know how it took me this long to hear his story about him playing for you know his family and him playing for his father. Uh, that makes me love the kid even more than I already did. Well, what are your thoughts on Game 1, your general thoughts before we dive into this thing more, you know, th- heavily? Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. The Just throughout this game, it just looked like the Raptors just had the upper hand throughout the entire night. It just looked like the Warriors were just, throughout this game, creeping close to the Raptors, but they just couldn't get that important stop. They couldn't get that big basket to maybe tie the game or take the lead late. They always like steamed one step behind the Raptors, and that's what I feel was the pace throughout this game. Just the Raptors were just a better t- team throughout. Yeah, no, you, you're right. You are right. The one thing that's crazy is it seemed like the Raptors were in control the whole time. Not that it seemed. They were. They absolutely were. But exactly. you look at the scoreboard, and the Raptors, it seemed like it, they should be up 60, 70 points, and the Warriors were only down 7 and yeah. that's credit to the Warriors being the Warriors because to, to be essentially almost that outplayed and to still be hanging around to the level that they were, that's how deep and, and how great they really are. But at the end of the day, the Raptors showed up, and I was truly impressed. Truly, truly impressed with the Raptors. But keep in mind, it is only one game. And with the NBA Finals, it seems like people can get so heavy invested in one game and run with that emotion for a little bit of time, not understanding it's a seven-game series. Yeah. I've been through that emotion myself, like we all know with the uh, the 76ers versus yeah, the Toronto absolutely. Raptors round two. We all saw that dominance in game three, and everyone said Sixers in six, and then we lose to a quadruple doinker in game seven, which we all cried after that, but it's over <laughs> with now in Toronto. We all have to be happy for them. Right yeah, now. oh yeah, listen, I, see, I, this is my question to you, because I know that there are a ton of Sixers fans out there that can't stand watching the Raptors, it kills them inside, oh, Kawhi this, and I, I'm ser- I'm serious, it, it's pretty crazy, and for me, personally, I say I'm over the quadruple doink, because realistically, I, I watch the NBA Finals without having to worry because there's sometimes I can't stand teams for example I'm watching the Stanley Cup I can't stand Boston so I'm I'm invested to the point where I'm actually emotionally rooting against the Boston Bruins when I watch this series I'm not doing that with the Raptors so in that regards I'm over the quadruple doink I just want to watch high quality basketball does the does the Sixers loss still hang around with you when you're watching this series I mean Knowing that we lost to the team that eventually is going to the NBA Finals, to me, that makes me feel 100 times better than seeing the Raptors probably either like getting swept by the Milwaukee Bucks or losing in seven to the Milwaukee Bucks. Just knowing in my heart that we lost to a completely better team than us and we draw, drew that team to a game seven off of a last second shot makes me feel really better just to see how close we were. Okay. And it also like made me feel more confident. Like Say if we beat it, beat the Raptors, we probably had a better chance against the Bucks because the Raptors just completely overall were the more better team in the Easter Conference and they deserve where they are. They deserve to be where they're at right now. Yeah, no, I, I, I see where your mindset is with that we could have beaten the Bucks, and I agree I agree with that completely. That was something that I stated during the time of it all happening, watching that that Eastern Conference finals. I said, ah oh, man, the Sixers gonna been there. I, I do want to look into this game one more you know, harshly, if you will, and, and critique some of the gameplay more, but obviously we easily get sidetracked with the Sixers, and, and I do have one point to bring up, because 
there is this narrative out there with Sixers fans that, oh, this should have been us. We would have, we would be in the finals right now. And I, I just, my, my mind process with that is you do need to keep in mind that, in my opinion, and like I said, we'll get back into the game one and, and look into that. But in my opinion, the the Raptors beat the Bucks because Kawhi Leonard is more established of a superstar than Giannis. Mm-hmm. I think we could have beaten the Bucks, absolutely. But yeah. when you come to more developed and more mature as a basketball player, Giannis is more mature and more developed than Ben Simmons is and Joel Embiid. So who says that that would have happened? Who said yeah. if we beat the Raptors, we're automatically in the finals? This narrative for Sixers I fans that agree, yeah, like this I narrative. Agree. This narrative that the Sixers fans think, oh, this would have been us, like definitely would have 100% been us. I don't buy into that right now. There's nothing that would have told me we're automatically in the finals and we're automatically beating the Golden State Warriors. That just, it just seems like the common narrative throughout the Sixers fans from what I see, like going through the whole like horrors of going through like the 10 and 72 season, all the horrors of the process with the terrible team that we have. It just feels like the fans think that the Sixers, they have to, they have to win it now for all the pain and suffering they caused us over these couple few years. Like, no, it's still Ben Simmons is 22. What is he going to do at 22 years old? I That'll be I, <laughs> Joel Embiid is still a kid. Even though he's 25, he's still a kid. He's still mentally young. You know what's funny? It took what? us. It took us seven minutes, and we're in Sixers mode already. Normally, that <laughs> takes a, at least a half hour to hop around like and knew, things. But that's our passion, got, man. I knew we got, we got would have gotten sidetracked, but I didn't think to this extent. But it's probably gonna happen again. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, listen. I, I got my <laughs> coffee. We wake up. We we'll wake up and say, "Yeah, let's do this early in the morning." And we're like, "Okay, yeah, that's a smart idea." We both text each other at seven a.m. We're saying, "Dude, are we really doing this?" Uh, yeah, I guess I'll get up. I need coffee though. <laughs> Ridiculous. Pumped. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, listen, I, I can talk sports all day long. So you wake me up and say, bro, you got to talk sports. Uh, I'm not <laughs> thinking in my head. Damn it. Do I? I'm, th- I'm like, okay. What are, what's the topic? <sighs> so anyway, as we get nuts, let's let's dive back into to game one here. And mm-hmm. when you look at when you look at the Raptors, you have to arguably say that. This Warriors team might be the shortest in size of length. Yeah. The, the shortest team that they've played against. And I that is a that. big factor. And you look, bringing up the Sixers again, but it's reality. Their size on some of their players were a problem in that series. Same yeah. with the Bucks, And the Bucks were, were smaller than the Sixers, but they're bigger than the Warriors. Mm-hmm. This is why Siakam, this is why Fred Van yeah. Vliet, this is why these guys can get open yeah. and get but, opportunities. Like going on the Siakam point, this is the most comfortable that I've seen him look in the playoffs, probably the, the entire playoffs, because like going back to that round against the Sixers, yeah, he maybe had like one game, but he just looked uncomfortable throughout. Same thing with, against the Milwaukee Bucks series. He just couldn't compete against the size. And now you got the Warriors team who is probably, like you said, the shortest in length of any team they probably face. This is probably really good for players like Siakam, for players like Van Vliet to get easy, better looks and more probably score more points. Yeah, and, and as we as we dive into this, I'm not trying to say that the Golden State Warriors can't <laughs> can't oh. win this oh, series. Oh, oh, you could never count out do never call it call out Golden State. Never count them out. Just they're Golden State. You can't do anything with them. Exactly. But basing this off of yesterday and basing this off of last night, uh, Iguodala looked bad. Draymond Green defensively. Mm -hmm. I didn't even realize he had a triple-double. When you take a look at Draymond Green defensively, it was horrible. He was Mm -hmm. getting toasted by Pascal Siakam. It wasn't even solid at all. Mm Mm-hmm. That's very, like... An underlook triple double, but that the over the play that Draymond Green showed last night would just like overshadowed his triple double, even though it's not even that impressive of a triple double. But his defensive play against Siakam was just like terrible. That's Siakam what he just, praised. Siakam trashed him. Yeah. <laughs> and it's funny, after the game, Drake was calling Draymond Green trash the whole time, and that was hilarious. It's funny you bring that up, because I'm pro-Drake. I'm a fan yeah. of Drake. I'm a fan of what Drake is doing on the sidelines. I find yeah. it very entertaining. It's 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 something that yeah. I can sit there and, and crack up about. It, that, that's, <laughs> that's what I think the NBA has. 
over every sport. I think just the relationship to the fans, because the fans can be so close to the action. That's like the type of stories. Like it's really cool to see, like even like big time celebrities like Drake, they can do, be as close as they want to the court and they can have this type of relationship with a team. Do you think it's overboard though? Sweat band screaming in your face, you're trash, get out of here. Do you think it's overboard what Drake's doing or do you think it's it's crossing the line? Do you think it's at the line? Because I'm at the point where it's at the line in my opinion. It's I, at the I, line. I, th- I think it's borderline almost what he's doing right now. Like, yeah, like he's a passionate fan. Yeah, he can talk trash to the enemy team all he wants. But I think like giving the coach like back rubs, as you stated before, I think that's maybe stretching it too much. Yeah. I think... Yeah, I mean, I I get the mindset of that. To 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 see some of the outrage though, it's it's hilarious. The one it thing is. that's funny, it's media, national media that are covering the game before the game. ESPN's there and all that. That storyline, that's a segment on a commercial mm-hmm. before a commercial break is. Well, what's Drake gonna do, or how is Drake <laughs> gonna react? That's a, a common conversation of this series, which is. Does it take away from the game? Is Does it make it fun? That's what I say. But I, I love it. I think it's entertaining from someone <laughs> outside or looking in. If Meek Mill was doing that at the Wells Fargo mm-hmm. Center, are we not loving it? Yeah, we would, we, would, we would hands down love that. So we really don't have a right to judge. <laughs> so Kawhi Leonard yesterday, he hit five shots. Where was that in our series? The guy hit five <laughs> shots, and they still dominate the game. Now, I don't know if the Raptors are going to be able to get – that type of night from everyone throughout mm-hmm. the series. You had everyone on the same page, yeah. everyone stepping up, everyone yeah. trying to be a, a huge piece of success. I don't know if they can carry that throughout the series in every single game. Yeah, it was like the Raptors, they had the – well, Kawhi Leonard, actually, he had the due diligence of having his whole team step up this time instead of him having to go out there and score 35-plus points probably – reaching near 50 points he was he wasn't hitting that many shots today he didn't really his field goal percentage really wasn't that good it was like wasn't it like in the 40s or something like that it was really wasn't that impressive but he had the he had the chance for his team to step up for him and like people like siak and people like gasol van vliet off the bench and yeah i think cool I don't think the Raptors can keep up that pace with the entire team performing like that, but I think maybe at least two more people like Gasol, maybe like Van, not Van Fleet, um, Siakam score. Like, not at the depth that they did yesterday, like 32. If Siakam can put at least 20 points on the board and Gasol can put at least 15 on the board, I think the Raptors will be fine. Yeah, and one thing you noted with Marcus Saul, at times, uh, Clay Thompson is defending Marcus Saul in the paint. And mm-hmm. it's not like DeMarcus Cousins was a solid answer out there. I don't know what they can do with that size in the post. They got creamed yesterday yeah. in that situation. They they brought over a double team at one point. Draymond Green yeah. left his guy wide open under the basket. And it was, it was a, a nightmare defensively. And not just... In half-court sets, the one biggest knock I saw on the Golden State Warriors yesterday, and you got to give credit to the Toronto Raptors, it was their transition. The -hmm. transition for the Raptors Mm -hmm. was perfect, and the transition defense for the Warriors was actually atrocious. I never Mm -hmm. seen it to that to that level where it was that garbage. They have to get back defensively, or they are going to get murdered. Exactly, exactly. And there was like, like a little note that I took. At the beginning of this game, the first 12 points from Toronto, they were all three point shots. You had Green taking a three point for the first points of the Raptors, and you had Leonard, and you had Gasol twice. The rap, the Warriors let Gasol shoot two threes in a row. Wide open. Like, wide, wide open. open. Wide yeah, open. Yeah, he, he had to like readjust his foot because he had mm-hmm. so much time. He had and so much he space. It. He had so much time, and he popped it, and he hit it. And they were, they were letting Gasol do that all night. They were giving him all the room. I get it. Like, he's a centered, like, He's probably not the best three-point shooter in the world, but when he has that much space, he'll drain it. Yeah, yeah. He's the hell. That is, and I stated this before, Marcus Saul was the X-Factor pickup. Obviously, mm-hmm. Kawhi Leonard is their guy that brings him to the promised land, but when yeah. you take a look outside of yeah. their their yeah. trade deadline, Marcus he, Saul was such a huge addition. Mm-hmm. He solidifies that starting five. He gives them a legitimate guy that can defend and a guy that can also produce offensively. 
Yeah, so, I I remember at the time saying, not that he was washed up, but he wasn't the Marc Gasol that we've seen before in his prime, but defensively, mm-hmm. and I mean, obviously offensively too, but defensively, this guy has brought just a different tier mm-hmm. to this yep. team. And I I've, I've, yep. I don't think the Warriors have ever seen a defensive team like this in the NBA Finals, oh, yeah. not not yeah. to this level. Going Yeah, going off that topic of the Warriors, like I think this is the war. This is going to be the Warriors' toughest matchup they've probably seen in years. The first round they went up against the Clippers. Yeah, the Clippers have defense, but they don't have the star talent. Uh, the the Toronto, not the Toronto, well, freaking the Houston Rockets. <laughs> they they shoot like a hundred three pointers a game and they don't play defense. So yeah, that's an easy matchup for Golden State. Um, Portland, they really don't have a good defense. Yeah, they have CJ McCollum, but they really weren't playing defense that much up to Golden State. So I really think this is the toughest matchup Golden State will probably face in it. I really think they need KD back, honest to God. I really think they need KD back in order to like win this series because I just the way they looked against Toronto yesterday, they just looked completely uncomfortable. Yeah, it's funny because a lot of those people saying, oh, they don't need KD, they don't need KD. They watch yesterday's game and all of a sudden they need KD back. Yeah. I was one of those people. I thought they didn't need KD. Just looking at them, what they did against Portland, but let alone Portland was a weaker opponent. So, yeah, I think they need KD just to make the matchups better for players like Steph Curry and Klay Thompson, maybe Draymond Green. They need they need KD back just to make the matchups probably better for them on their part of the side of the board. Yeah, I I originally thought that they'd be able to hang in there better without KD than they did. And it's funny, as much as we do say the Raptors dominated, I can't stop thinking about the opportunities where it was the third quarter, it was the fourth quarter, early fourth quarter, and it was a four-point game. And Mm -hmm. and so as much as we sit here and say, oh, they got crushed, they got crushed, that could have been a a flip of the switch. How the hell did the Warriors pull that out in a heartbeat? Exactly. It's, It's just like what we were stating earlier. There just wasn't that key moment for the Warriors to take the momentum the rest of the game. There just wasn't that key shot they made. There wasn't that key defensive stop they made. They there just wasn't let the Raptors many. Do the, they just let the Raptors do their thing. Yeah, there, there wasn't awesome. many defensive efforts for the Warriors. I'm stunned. I really am because they, they, they know better. And mm-hmm. you hear all the reporters after the game, Golden State Warriors in that locker room, there's not one, one inch of mm-hmm. worry. They are not worried. They Definitely just not. know that, all right, we got to fix things. Steve Kerr is amazing at adjustments. Mm-hmm. Not not just halftime situations coming out for the third quarter, which he's good at too. But game to game, this guy is a, a masterpiece. And mm-hmm. I expect them to make big adjustments. And the first adjustment I see them making, it is defensively. It is getting mm-hmm. back in transition. It's, it's making plays on the defensive yep. side because we hear this all the time. Defense creates offense and when you get yep. stops you can move forward and, and get transition points in favor of of the warriors to be able to shoot their transition threes or whatever mm-hmm. the case may be but the more mm-hmm. i watch that warriors team i sit there and i say okay uh, looney what is that bell what is that when i watch this warriors team as much as i respect their dynasty I'm watching Sean Livingston on the floor with Bell, Looney, DeMarcus Cousins, who's a bum, and I'm saying, mm-hmm. what? Where are you? Where are you going to get anything with this lineup? Yeah. What, what is your game plan to get any type of scoring with this yeah. lineup on the floor with Kawhi out there at times? Yeah, the, the freaking the bench from Golden State just couldn't do anything. It it was honestly, I don't want to say embarrassing. It was kind of sad they couldn't really do anything. I understand they were putting them out against Kawhi, but. At least put some points on the board, but they just couldn't do anything. I was so all. underwhelmed with everyone on Golden State. Yeah. Even Steph Curry, he shot eight of eighteen, and I know he mm-hmm. had thirty-four points, but that wasn't a night where you sit there and say, "That's Steph Curry." Yeah, it wasn't a Steph Curry typical night. He looked, he did look uncomfortable from what I've seen. Well, if no one's stepping up, I, yeah. I mean, there's only so much you can do, and you can see mm-hmm. times when Kawhi and Marcus all both went on him and put their hands up, mm-hmm. and Steph Curry's trying to make a pass, and it gets deflected, and then it's all turnovers, turnovers. Golden State looked like the Sixers yesterday when it came to turning the ball over. Mm-hmm. Exactly. 
it, exactly. it was it was a wild wild thing to watch but i <laughs> loved it i loved the energy in the crowd the place was super special to to see and and once again i know that there are sixers fans out there that watch that and can't stand can't stand seeing the raptors get excited all these raptors fans are fake and of oh, stop it you don't i always think to myself when i hear people cr uh, criticizing raptors fans i always think to myself do you remember how you acted when the Eagles won the Super Bowl? Think about what every fan base thought about us when we won when the we Super Bowl. Won. Oh, They're God. thinking the same thing times 500. <laughs> it's Philadelphia against the rest of the world, and we're showing that hatred right now towards Toronto. But, yeah, just let Toronto have their moment, people. Just let Toronto have their moment. They deserve to be there. Simple. You can't change the past. Simple as that. The Sixers... Had their chance. They lost on a quadruple doinker in the final seconds. The Sixers were just close. They just couldn't get it done. They do, they do deserve to be there. The more you, yeah. you say that statement, and that's that's one of the things I mentioned late in my in my game recap video. They've they have played with this type of intensity that I don't think I've seen out of a team making a run in a long time. Keep in mind, we've seen the Warriors and the Cavs match up four mm -hmm. times in a row. And what was it four? Was it three? I forget off the top of my head. So many I damn th times. I, th I, th I think it was four. Yeah. And four. there's this new face in there who's playing with this passion for the fan base, a team that's never been there. They're playing with this swag right now and, and a lot of confidence. And I get that. Yeah. I just don't know if I've seen a team in a while with this much fight behind their play. Mm -hmm. and, I love it, uh, though. And, and, I'll, tell, and I'll tell you something right here. It's just, to me, like seeing this finals, like Golden State against Toronto, it's really weird for me not seeing LeBron James in this final. It's just really weird because he's been to the finals so many years in a row. It's just like odd not seeing LeBron James in this against Golden State, it just really boggles me. That See, I'm, just, you know me, I'm a LeBron's man. Mm -hmm. And when I first started watching basketball, like this is how it worked for me. I, I was such a hockey guy for my whole life, and so are you, the hockey-basketball matchup. It, it doesn't really connect. You're either one or the other. And then I met my, my one of my good buddies from high school, and he was a big basketball guy, not mm -hmm. a big hockey guy. So then we kind of... We kind of uh, put our put our two passions together, and we both taught each other the game, and then I became a big basketball guy. Well, that was the first year LeBron made the finals with Miami. So since I became a legitimate diehard basketball fan, mm -hmm. I've never not seen LeBron in the finals. I've seen LeBron in the finals every single time mm -hmm. until this year. It's the first time I've never seen it. And yeah. it's and as much as I love LeBron, it's kind of nice. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a nice sight to see that you don't have to see LeBron James and and picking up his poor, poor sorry ass Cleveland Cavaliers to the finals. Yeah, that's crazy to even process what he did with that team last year. Mm -hmm. And and I hate that people count it against his his loss record. Come on, man, it doesn't even make sense to count that towards a loss record and and just say oh, oh three yeah. and six, three and six. Oh, like. The, 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 now that you mentioned that that poor is Cleveland Cavaliers team from last year, it just reminds me of the first game at the last second. What, <laughs> J.R. Smith? Where J.R. Smith just pulled the most idiotic move in an NBA game I've ever seen. You know what's funny? This is the second time that's been brought up. I, I did a Can the Raptors Beat the Warriors podcast, and somehow uh -huh. J.R. Smith's bum ass made the, made the commentary. Here we are going with this, and J.R. Smith's bum ass makes the commentary once again. That's going to be the... That's gonna be the most idiotic move in probably NBA history. That's probably the probably the top Shaq in a full moment on his countdown. I would say Shaq, Shaq in a fool. Now you bring uh, okay. Here we here we go. You bring up Shaq in a fool. <laughs> I I I actually hate the TNT crew. I I mean I can see that I I could under totally understand why you would hate the TNT crew because they can be a bit annoying. I don't do find them entertaining. I, I mean, I, I like I like Kenny. See, I don't like the Shaq and Charles thing. Uh, Charles yeah. is a good guy. I'm not knocking them personally. But as a crew and, and post-game shows and in the middle mm -hmm. of halftime when my Sixer squad's playing or whatever, shut up. I don't yeah. I don't even like anything that they're saying. They mm -hmm. just they, they play this personality thing where they don't even talk about basketball. They just go in there and they, they just they hang out with friends. And I get that. Mm -hmm. That's cool that it's a personal level that they can just go out there and not be so broadcasty, but they then, do it to an extreme, and and it, and it's not entertaining in my opinion. I think it's stupid. 
And then half of the other time, it's Charles and Shaq arguing against each other the whole time. It'll be Shaq arguing, I have more rings than you, and Charles like, okay. Yeah, when they bring Shaq. out the water guns and start shooting each other with it. What Basically. the hell was that? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I, I'm a I'm a hometown guy anyway. Normally, well, I guess when, when it's on TNT. But yeah. see, the difference is I've watched the Philly post the Philly halftime show on NBC oh, Sports oh, Philadelphia, yeah. and, and, and that's my enjoyment. I watch that yeah. because it's it's people yeah. breaking down the game. It's people using yeah. basketball knowledge and yeah. breaking down the game. This is what yeah. happened. This is what can happen. This is what they need to do next yeah. half. This is what yeah. they have to stop and stop moving and turn yeah. the ball over. In my mind, nothing beats the Philly broadcast from each game. Nothing really beats it. Yeah, Mark Zumoff's the best, man. And mm-hmm. and I, I've i started to get more involved with Ala. He's okay. He doesn't doesn't spark it like some might. It's, he's, he doesn't really get it going for me. But Mark Zumoff carries the squad. Oh, definitely. He's a Hall of Famer, dude. He's a right. Hall of Famer. He really he is, is in the broadcasting yes. world for the NBA. Yeah, he is a Hall of Famer. He's... Probably one of the. He's probably one of the. He probably is the best Philadelphia announcer, right now. Yeah, yeah. I see. You want to hear something? I'm, I'm, I'm starting to become anti Jim Jackson. I used well, to love Jim Jackson. So, now he so. just bothers the hell out of me. What does he do? That I don't. You? I don't know. I don't know what he does. It's just like maybe it's the Flyers it. that just piss me off, and I put him in in it because he just bothers me so much. I put him in it because of the damn logo. <laughs> I don't know. Don't, don't bring up the Flyers in this podcast. Yeah, right? you're right. This, is basketball. Bring, this basketball. is basketball. Basketball. Well, I'm wearing a Flyers break. shirt. I'm wearing a Flyers hat. I did this for you because I know you're a hockey guy. <laughs> I'm wearing a Flyers hat right yeah, now. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I'll go change it to a Flyers shirt right now. No, bro. you don't have to. You don't have to. I promise. I thought you were, though. I said, all right, before we get on, I think we're going to wear the same shirt. And then I, I walk like... on and I see Phillies. I was like, eh, do I want to wear flyers today? I wore flyers yesterday. I'll it's go, right, you got, I'll go you, Bryce Harper. I'll yeah, Bryce you Harper. got you got it all in the background anyway. Yeah. So, Th- getting that's, back. That, that's devastating in the background. Don't pay attention to that. Yeah. Well, just the logo is devastating, so don't even pay attention to my <laughs> shirt. If you're if you're listening on the podcast and not watching on YouTube, you're lucky because you don't have to stare at this crest of a logo. Man, I'm brutal. All right. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Flyers 2020 Stanley Cup champions right here. Just said it right now. <laughs> oh, no. The one play that stood out to me the most, and it's kind of silly to think this is the play that made the the biggest impact, but in my opinion, it did. It was late third quarter. The Warriors were making one of their many pushes, and mm-hmm. out of anyone on the court, McCall drains a three with the shot clock expiring. Yep. Yep, I remember that play boldly. Wasn't he a former warrior? Yeah. yeah. Oh it's yeah. Just, <laughs> that must have been like a freak, that must have been a pain in the ass to see from the warrior standpoint. <laughs> One that of our former was, players during a three. That, that was a difference making play. Mm-hmm, it really was. Mm-hmm. And that's why and when also, I said, look at the depth of this team, everyone. Mm-hmm. Everyone made a play that was significant. Yeah. And I come to um what I think it was the end of the third or the fourth quarter, Van Vliet. Where he just like it was a buzzer beater. He just tossed a two up in the air, and then it r- rolled around the rim for a couple seconds. Then hit the backboard, then went in. And Dude, it went, it went Dude. like don't two even get me started the with went these out. with these rims. It's funny. I, I this is also something I mentioned in the post game recap show, and and they said, and all the Raptors fans were like, "Well, if there's magnets on there, wouldn't it be the same thing for the Warriors?" And I thought to myself. Damn, how did I not think about that? <laughs> well, it's, I don't. It's something the no, Warriors no. specifically did for their for their rims. I've, yeah. dude, I've I've watched basketball like I've said since LeBron's first year in the in the finals, which I know isn't that long for mm-hmm. being a b- basketball fan here. But yeah. I've never, I've yeah. I've actually never seen anything anything to this degree when it comes to the rims. Now, here's the theory. Um, yeah, hit me with it. After every half. When well when before the half starts, before they change sides, the Raptors, the the crew on the court, they'll take the the net off each basket. They'll put the net that the Raptors are going to shoot on. That's the net that has the magnets on it. That's what or I'm saying, dude. The, the Warriors side does not have nets. They probably have rep- ball repellent on it. <laughs> that was ridiculous. 
<laughs> I'm sitting there, and every time it happens, uh, it's not that, oh, the quadruple bounce couldn't have went the other way. No, I'm, I'm done with that talk. I'm done with that nonsense. But I sit there, and every time I see a ball hit the front rim, hit the backboard, rim around six times, uh, my, my, my mouth drops. Are, are you serious? How does this happen every time? The game is rigged. What can I say? The the, the rim is rigged. Well, let's not talk about being rigged I'm with the I'm NBA not. because then I'm that not. can get sidetracked into a whole I'm other conversation. <laughs> and that goes into with the rigging, with the, with the referees. There are a lot of people out there that, that were in, insanely disappointed with the refs in favor of Toronto. And I, I just, I can't believe that and, and once again, my circle and my Twitter feed and, and of course, is Sixers fans, keep in mind. But it's, mm-hmm. it goes outside of just Sixers fans. There are a lot of people that are actually thinking the refs were the reason why the Raptors win. Now, listen, there were times, and this happens throughout every NBA game ever, the yeah, refs waited right for the basket to not go in, and then they call the foul. That's every game I could ever think of with the NBA. Mm-hmm. But you can't look at that game, and you are you can't say, well, the the reason was the the referee. The Raptors out-competed the Warriors in, in, in every, mm-hmm. listen to me, Every aspect of the game. Mm-hmm. I completely agree with you, and I'd never want to go on that mentality of blaming the refs for a game. Yeah, the refs might suck, but they're not the reason your team lost. Just admit the other team played better than you. Well, there are the, the, well, there are times, yeah. especially in basketball, where you can yeah. go heavy on refs, and I've seen yeah. it. This was nowhere even close to the time of that. And yeah, this comes to my NHL rant. The free, I believe the freaking hockey refs are worse than NBA refs sometimes. <laughs> I don't know if that's true, and I'll tell you why. Mm-hmm. Because in basketball, the ticky tackness of it compared to missing a trip or missing a hook or seeing a you know a, a missed a hit to the head like they did in Game Two of the Stanley Cup Finals, it it's not as significant as mm-hmm. every single time down the floor with a ticky tack touch on the elbow or a shot that they're contesting at the three-point line. No one even touches him, but the guy falls back five feet and he gets free, three free throws. I just mm-hmm. think there's more calls in basketball to make than one missed call. And I know that one missed call in hockey can lead to a goal that wouldn't have been scored, and that could be a difference maker. You're right, but mm-hmm. the, the every single up and down the floor calls that happen in the NBA, I think that is the problem that makes yeah. the NBA worse. When you talk about the Houston Ross- Rockets and our constant flopping. Yeah, well, yeah, and, and it's not an easy job. I'm not saying it is in any sport, in any yeah. sport. I mean, who am I to judge? It's, I scream on my TV. <laughs> yeah, when I was watching your last podcast, you and your cousin were complaining about the um- umpiring in baseball. Yeah, hey, <laughs> like, well, there's a point. Angel, Angel Hernandez and Joe West. Okay. Yeah, well, the, I mean, listen, that's sports. Should we go with an electronic referee for the NBA? Well, we touched oh, God. Him. We touched oh, God. Him. Oh god, I don't want to see that. I don't want to see that. I'm hey, sorry. Hey, we'll take the human error out of the game, as some people say. How would that work? But how would that work? Isn't there someone that has to operate the robot that is operating the, that is calling the game? On well, I it? wasn't going to think as that? I wasn't. Well, no, because robots aren't robots are legitimate things. People don't control the robot. So if there was a robot running down the floor, no one. It's not a remote control. These things are functional and legitimate pieces that work on their own. Because yeah, I remember this one point that you brought up, like when calling the strike zone in baseball, if there was a electronic strike zone, and you said there was someone like watching the game from above that was hit, pressing a button that said ball or strike. That's right. human error because they can honestly see, oh, that's a ball to me, I'll press ball. Or that's a strike to me, I'll press strike. Well, it, it would be... It, but the it'll... screen would tell you what it is. Yeah. It's still not them choosing. I'm yeah. thinking right now, though, that you mentioned it, how this would work with, with an NBA ref. I'm not thinking as far as robots running <laughs> back and forth on the court, on the sideline, putting that their hand ridiculous. up, blowing a whistle. I'm not going to the extreme of that. But what if what if the players wore like those? I'm thinking of when when NHL the video game or NBA the what, video game has those things attached to them in the black suits so they what, can record things. You know what I'm saying? What, like like sensors. 
I guess. And then if if a, if if a player gets hit on the arm, a green censure goes off uh, in the NBA room and whistle oh blows, and then gets to the free throw line, so you can see the contact if it was made uh, or not. Imagine if those things malfunction and it goes off every time touched. That would be that would be funny. Honestly, well, God. you know what? And I brought this up in in the one strike zone video too. As crazy as that seems, uh-huh. think of think about. 50 years ago, 60, 70, 80 years ago, and telling someone, yeah, there's going to be a guy named Steph Curry who's going to drain 7,000 three-pointers in three games. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah you okay. Would la- you would probably laugh at that, but it's happening right now. Exactly. Even, can, dude, I- virtual reality where you're mm-hmm. sitting in your house on your couch watching a game from the front row? Say mm-hmm. that to someone 50 years ago. They would probably laugh in your face. They would spit in my mouth. I don't know why. If I had coffee in it, I don't know. That made no sense. Add some creamer to it. Terrible joke. One of my worst jokes I've ever had. Let's not bring your coffee addiction into this joke. Dude, I need another coffee. We still got some time here, and I need another coffee. See, here's here's how I am on the coffee game. Once it hits a certain temperature, I'm out. And the temperature isn't even... It's 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 warm. I need it to be steaming hot for my coffee. So once it hits this warm you test that I'm playing with now, I'm anti coffee. <laughs> you need it to be mouth burning coffee. Yes, I do. <laughs> and then I, I do, I do, I do. And I like my coffee black and I, I love coffee. I need coffee. Oh You'd be called a demon for saying you like your coffee black. Oh god. Why? I know a lot <laughs> I just know a lot of friends that despise black coffee. They just well, they have to have something in their coffee to make it taste better. If I go out to Wawa Dunkin', I'm not just going to order a black coffee. But if I'm at mm-hmm. home, yeah, black coffee all the time. See, here's the, here's the thing. My buddies go with the black iced coffee. Black. Oh, no, no, no. Why? Now, I mean, come on. Throw in a little French vanilla swirl. You know what I'm saying? If you're going to go so iced coffee, you need, you need flavor in the iced coffee. Black coffee, hot, is good. <laughs> we should make a, a call. You're, you're not a coffee guy, I assume. I am not a coffee guy. Uh, I'll we'll, go, podcast I'll go, episode number five: Sports coffee. Talk with Broads, Coffee Grinds. <laughs> Let's go I'll, over the I'll, coffee grinds. I'll go downstairs and get myself a nice cup of that orange juice, but I won't get coffee. I respect I that. Now, are you I pulp hate. or no pulp? Because I'm pulp. <laughs> I hate pulp. No, dude. Pulp is good. It adds pulp. a little bit to it. Pulp is disgusting. No what do you way, mean? man. You add a little pulp bit of pulp. Disgusting. Let's go. It's amazing. Uh, I even I don't even mind the extra pulp. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, he lost his internet connection right there. And this is going to be edited, so you won't even realize it. But he lost his internet connection. As I made the statement, I love pulp. And I just feel like. You know, there was a tie there. Your internet said, this guy is ridiculous. I can't even stand him on my feed. I'm going to drop the internet because I can't stand listening to this idiot Broads talk about loving extra pulp. Wait, you love extra pulp? I don't even mind. That's that's news to me. You didn't hear it. I didn't hear a bit of that. You didn't hear the extra pulp? No. Ooh, all right. Well, there's only so much we can go on about the extra pulp, but I don't mind it. That's a whole podcast in itself. Don't you know what? I'm, to celebrate this podcast, when we're done, I'm going to go get some extra pulp orange <laughs> juice. And I'm going to send you a picture on my way to work. Please don't. Okay. So, going back to, to, to the NBA finals here, which is what's really important. Do you mm-hmm. think any of them like extra pulp? Oh, God. Probably. <laughs> no. Okay. All right. Now, let, let's just – there's some things that stood out to me. And and one of them was looking back in the in the game one before we look in the game two is is Iguodala and I thought he was gonna be not so much an X factor but I, I thought he'd I I mean I guess his his thing is defense and taking mm-hmm. a look at someone like Kawhi Leonard it's not like Kawhi Leonard had the most outstanding game ever offensively like we talked about he he was a, a, a drawing a lot of attention from the Warriors. Or from the Raptors' defense, so he did his job in regards to that to open up play from his players. But he had open looks; he was missing them, clanking them, airballing them, going too far. Iguodala offensively sucked, and I wonder if this was something that's coming with his old age, or if he can bounce back from there in Game Two. But what did you see out of Iggy? I thought, I thought offensively, like he needs to be better. I know he's not this offensive juggernaut, but he needs to be better than that. Yeah. 
in my opinion. He was very invisible offensively. And wasn't there one play where he came up limping and it was like a, a little bit of a scary sight? He left he the game early, yeah. Apparently they're not as they're not as scared about it as they were early when they first saw him limping. Because I remember seeing something on Twitter and they might like reevaluate him in the next 48 hours or so before Sunday. So That would make the most I'm, sense. I'm not, I'm not saying he's going to be questionable for Game 2. He's probably going to start Game 2 because it's the NBA Finals and you're not going to sit out the NBA Finals. So he, yeah, he'll probably yeah. be ready. I wonder what this Kevin Durant thing is, because originally it seemed like it was an Achilles tear, and then we find out it's not, and now it's just a calf strain, but he's not playing still. Uh, my guess is this dude won't play on the, like, if he's not playing by the third game, and the first mm -hmm. game in Golden State, the second game he's in Golden State. The series. Yeah, yeah, I think they're trying to cover something up here. I feel like it's more, it's worse than what they're letting on right now. I mean, it has to, to be, it has to, to be at this point. Not playing the entire series against Portland even though Golden State handled them pretty well, they need Kevin Durant, and I think his injury, injury is worse than what they're letting on right now from that medical staff. It's kind of sounding like the Sixers medical staff at this point because you really don't know what they're talking about. Yeah, I, well, I don't know if I'm going to go to the extreme of the Sixers <laughs> because I think that they're they're playing a, a game. What, what it is is, you know, it's... I don't know. I'm trying to put it in perspective of if Joel Embiid had a calf strain, but it looked mm -hmm. like an Achilles tear, and they were sitting there telling us one thing and not the other, I'd be complaining that what the hell is this medical staff. But it's mm -hmm. different because it's not like the Warriors have done this over the years. This is a one-time yeah. thing, and it's it's not hidden. We yeah. know. Everyone knows. All of us. We understand that there is something more. So it's not... A, it's not... I, I don't know. I, I don't know how I'm trying to how I'm trying to word this, but what I'm essentially trying to say is, no one's fooled. No one's fooled. Everyone no knows fooled. that there's a serious problem there. Yeah. So I just see it differently. With Embiid, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I guess everyone would know he's hurt too. So I don't know where I'm going with this point. To be honest with you, it's all those Chick Fil A milkshakes, dude. Yeah. That, well, yeah. Well, did you think Kevin Durant's drinking? I, I Chick-fil-A milkshakes, or do you think he, he's, he's drinking, drinking orange, orange juice with an extra orange, pulp? <laughs> it's probably the orange juice with extra pulp, man. That stuff kills you. Yeah, that would make your ligaments stronger, especially in the calf. <laughs> so looking into game two, what do the Raptors have to do to... I mean, you can look at it both ways. What do the Raptors have to do to make sure that they come out with a performance like that? Or what does the Warriors, what do they have to do to adjust to what the Raptors did? See, I, I think of it as guys got open looks for the Warriors, but it's mm -hmm. your it's your loonies, it's your bells, it's your Iguodalas, it's your Draymond Greens. Of course, there was a couple times where miscues are going to happen defensively and Steph Curry will get a look or Clay will get a look. But all around, I don't know how great of looks the Warriors got. And, and there were times. And I know DeMarcus Cousins didn't play that much when you look at his total minutes, but mm -hmm. they tried to run the offense through him in the post, and we've seen yeah. that throughout the season. That's not their game. Their game is quick, fast pace, go out there, run the floor, play. Yep. They got to pick up the pace and play with their level of play. I mm -hmm. didn't like the whole bring it back into the post, let Boogie Burt work it down. This guy hasn't played basketball in how long? He's not in shape. He's not in rhythm. I, mm -hmm. I know you want the guy to play. I think you got to work on, on getting your guys better looks based off of the defensive intensity that the Raptors brought. Mm -hmm. And like what you said, I think the major part of the Warriors game that they didn't show yesterday, last night was the transition game. Their transition game was just not that good. In both ways. In both, both ways. ways. Yeah. Especially defensively. The transition game was horrible for Golden State. And I think that's what I'm used to seeing them thrive on. That's what I'm used to seeing Golden State thrive on, like coming up with a quick three out of transition, coming up with a quick stop out of tra transition. They weren't able to do that last night, and that's what they really have to fix going into game two, honestly, from my standpoint. But for the Raptors, just – I feel like – I do think they do need more out of Kyle Lowry because his point off his night offensively was really abysmal. He was a but, pest defensively, yeah, though. He was a pest defensively, though. Yeah, I'll give him that. But he does need to provide more offensively. But I, I know he's had his games where he has shown up offensively in the playoffs, but I feel like it's been more on the other side where he doesn't really show up offensively, but he still shows that pest side of his game 
So that's one thing. But I think for the Raptors in general, just don't let the moment get to you. Just go into this game, just be mentally prepared, and ju- try to go out and do this. Don't do the same exact thing because it's not going to be the same exact thing, but try to d- go out and just play play your game, play the way you know how to play. Yeah, just- so the, the thing is, and I was just thinking about this here when we're talking about, okay, what do the Raptors need to do? And the first thing I say to myself is, well, almost play the same way. And then I say to myself, you know, this is one big thing that I always talked about in regards to the Raptors when they played the Sixers. When mm-hmm. Game 1 happened, no matter what happened in Game 1, both teams will make adjustments. Game yes. 2 will not be the same thing as Game 1. Game 3 mm-hmm. will not be the game thing as Game 2. So when I take a look at this, I say, okay, well, with the Raptors, I don't think they can just implement that game yeah. plan every single game and it's going to work. Because that's just not yeah. how, how it goes. So if I'm just saying... And, and you kind of touched on this earlier. You know, you don't expect Siakam to get 32 every night. If, if he gives you 25-plus and, and Gasol gives you 18 or whatever the numbers you said, they'll be okay. But what if Fred Van Vliet, what if they had the same night they had, the same night they had, but Fred Van Vliet didn't score all those points off the bench? So they, they played the same way. All the players stepped up except for one player. Do mm-hmm. they lose that game? Do they, though? I mean, really. Do the Warriors that's, win that game if Fred Van Vliet didn't have the night that he had? That's a tough question to answer. I uh, would say yes. I would say the Warriors would have won that game if Fred Van Vliet didn't have the game that he had. So, And, and that keeps coming back to something I said earlier with as much as the Raptors did dominate and as bad as I thought the Warriors played defensively, especially in transition and Draymond Green, their best defender, and how they weren't knocking down these shots offensively with Iguodala and all that. Mm-hmm. It it really was in reach almost. Yeah, the the Warriors had their chances to come back. They just couldn't do it. But I feel like game two, that's going to be a different story. I feel like the Warriors will be able to adjust to that. I feel like they, they're going to make it more difficult for the Raptors. This is big. Two. This is big. Game two is so big because yeah. the narrative switches. If mm-hmm. the war, if the Warriors win, if the Warriors win, and I I know I've went over this a couple times, but you, if you're Toronto, you have to act like the first two games in this series is the finals because being up 2-0 going to Golden State, the pressure is insane. If they mm-hmm. squeak one win out of there in in Golden State, you are now up three one going back to Toronto. But If the Warriors win game two of this series in Toronto, you're going back to Golden State with a a chance for Golden State to go up 3-1 if they take control of their two home games. I totally agree with you. I completely agree with you. That's why you got to treat the game two like you're winning the championship. You got to treat it like the championship is on the line. You got to play all out. You cannot afford to lose this game. You cannot afford a, a big momentum switch going into Golden State. Kawhi Leonard interests me so damn much. I think he's a great player. I do. Mm -hmm. But I'm still not putting him over LeBron or KD right now. He's third. and But uh, I say that and I get crushed. That's not a knock to say that Kawhi Leonard is the third best player in the league, in my opinion. That's no no knock. There's tears involved. Mm -hmm. You can't tell me that Kawhi Leonard is better than LeBron James. I'm sorry, you can't tell me that. Kevin Durant, people want to argue the numbers are the same. Well, look at his points per game, look at his minutes, look at his rebounds. He's playing with Steph Curry and Klay Thompson. Uh, yeah, Steph Curry and Klay Thompson. You put Kawhi Leonard with Steph Curry and Klay Thompson, you lose scoring. You lose some of his scoring, you lose some of his offensive game. Well, that's what's happening with Kevin Durant. He's losing some of his numbers because Steph needs shots, Clay needs shots. Clay Tom or I'm getting off the here. Kevin Durant is a better scorer than Kawhi Leonard is, without a doubt. His de- his defense isn't as good, but all around I'm starting a franchise. I'm taking Kevin Durant over Kawhi Leonard. Kawhi Leonard to me is amazing, but he's the third best player in the league, in my opinion. And that's not a knock. That's because the other players are so good. Kawhi Leonard is so good. He's in superstar tiers that take teams to finals. That's not a knock on Kawhi Leonard. Is that a ridiculous statement for me to say that he's third in the league? Nope, not at all. Third in the league. That's respectful. Yeah. It's like, who would you take? Yeah, like what you said, who would you take starting his franchise? I would take. Kevin Durant because he is just like I'm not gonna knock Kawhi Leonard 
without a doubt. But I think Kevin Durant's more of the franchise changer. Like you said, he's Kawhi just is off. a franchise changer, though. I'm yeah. not seeing, but that's where I'm. I'm still at that level with Kawhi Leonard. That doesn't change. He changes a franchise. He takes teams to the yeah. finals. He's that level, but a, a a little bit behind Kevin Durant, in my opinion. Yeah, it's like what you said. Kevin Durant's playing with also two franchise changers and Steph Curry and Clay Thompson to where his statistical, his point is not the same as probably what he say he would put up in Oklahoma City or something like that. Yeah. Because he's, he's on such a stacked team that his his production's probably not going to be as the same because it's probably going to be evenly spread out throughout the board. The one thing, too, that you always have to remember with, with sports is the now, the right mm-hmm. now. And we're watching Kawhi go on this run, so it's wow. And after, and and once again, I do not listen to national sports media, so I know on a on a on a different level of of clickbait. That's what they root for. But you know, he, he has his game against the Sixers, forty five. The headlines is Kawhi Leonard better than Michael Jordan. And listen, I know uh, national sports media is ridiculous to begin with, but it's all about the now, and everyone's mm-hmm. seeing what Kawhi Leonard is doing right now. But I'm still putting him in the third best player in the league category, and I would take that any day of the week. I would want Kawhi on my team any day of the week. I, I, he 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 changes the culture of every single team, and that's no knock on him to put him third. But I just mentioned that, and I say to myself, well, we brought Jimmy Butler in here because of his culture-changing methods, and he's this dog. He's this guy. I think Kawhi Leonard brings that same level of intensity to his team than Jimmy Butler does without the extra noise and without that extra swagger. He's like a guy who just has that Jimmy Butler mentality work ethic wise without the voice. And I think it almost brings the same level of culture to the Raptors than say Jimmy Butler did without the noise. Yeah, but I mean, like what we were talking about earlier, like how robots can possibly transition into this like refereeing. I think I think there's already a robot in this league within Kawhi Leonard because this dude just shows no emotion. It's I, crazy. It just, just shows no emotion, and how many times you see on social media with that laugh that he did in his press conference for Toronto, that is probably the closest emotion you'll see Kawhi Leonard do. Like even though he did show emotion on that buzzer beater, beater against the Sixers, he did. Oh, he did, yeah. dude. He mouth wide he open. Cr- ah! He showed yeah. it. Yes. You do not see this dude show any kind of emotion whatsoever. He, this dude is just the pure robot. This it's, dude, it's mind-blowing. And he's so damn good. He's and, so damn good. And do you think it's the orange juice with the pulp that's making him a robot? Do you well, think it's uh, listen, the robots drink? Uh, leave a voicemail on the voicemail box line. 856-442-9805. Do robots drink orange juice with pulp? Let me know. Or do they drink black coffee? Oh, or do they... they definitely drink black coffee. You think a robot is going to be pouring cream into his black coffee? I don't know, man. It's all accounts of their taste, dude. <laughs> That's awesome. What if uh, Kawhi Leonard just likes this fancy tasting coffee? What if he doesn't like just straight up black coffee? Nah. You know, I don't there's, I'm not buying it. Like when Dario Scharch and the Sixers media staff used to always uh, – do you follow them on Twitter, uh, the Sixers Twitter page? Yeah. I think so. The here, the here they come post they put before the games when Dario was here. He always had a little cup of coffee. It was tiny, tiny, tiny in his big hands. I'm telling you, it had to have been black coffee. There's no way Dario put cream in that. He's he's a he's a euro. All right, so <laughs> I see. I I want to bring this up, and it's interesting because you are such a hockey guy. Not that you're not a basketballsman. I know you are. Mm-hmm. The NBA finals to me. Now I played hockey my whole life. Hockey is. You know, the Stanley Cup Finals to me is something that I've mentioned where that's me in my driveway playing roller hockey, four years old, I'm winning the Stanley Cup, I'm throwing my gloves up. I, I mean, I, I did that all day long. I used to, my mom would call call me in for dinner, I'd have my rollerblades on in the house, eating dinner, and I'd go right back outside and win the cup three more times. So watching the Stanley Cup to me has a spot in my heart because I, I dreamed of winning it just like all of these guys playing in it. The NBA Finals, though, and maybe it's because I do this now and I'm trying to get into the field of broadcasting and journalism and and the NBA Finals has more pop and more swag to it. The NBA Finals, to me, is beautiful. I, I mean, it's the way it's perceived, the anticipation going into each game, 
the half court sets, the pressure, the moments that these guys go through. Two minutes left in the fourth quarter of an NBA final game on the road, and you got to execute plays and and set picks and and defend. And there's something to me about the NBA finals that I I have this this love for, and I sit there and I admire it, and I just love it. How do you feel about it in comparison to the Stanley Cup Finals? Because I know hockey is your number one. Mm-hmm. The one thing I will give the NBA Finals over hockey, it has a lot more character to it. The players, comparison to players in the NBA, comparison to players in the NHL, there's a lot more character with players in the NBA. You got NHL players that are just sitting over with a blank stare at the locker room saying, oh, we just got to get her next time, uh, take it to the <laughs> next game and all that stuff. It's just... There's more fuel within NBA players because there's more character. There's more emotion. With NHL players, I still throw, in my opinion, the Stanley Cup above the NBA Finals just because the Stanley Cup to me is more one of a kind because it's probably the best trophy award to win in sports because it's the only one there. Like with how you have the uh, Super Bowl, the Lombardi Trophy, it's made every year. Same thing with the Commissioner Trophy in the MLB. Same thing with the NBA Finals trophy. It's just the Stanley Cup, in my opinion, just probably the best one to win just because you only have it for a summer and then it's gone. Now, I do agree with you with that. You only have a banner to celebrate it. I I do agree with you with that because, you know, you and, and it's interesting. You win an NBA championship, you need to win five for it to mean anything. You're a one time Stanley Cup champion, and that yeah. changes legacy to a different level. Because the yeah. sports are just different when it comes to domination of eras. I, I do I do know what you mean when it comes to trophy standpoint. You're right. I mean, to, there, there really is nothing like the Stanley Cup because it's so unique and, and there is only one and it, it's just different. It's different. Yeah. It, it, maybe that comes with the presentation of it. So, yeah, just with dynasties, I feel like the NFL – I feel like in the NBA, honestly, I feel like dynasties can still happen. But it's just the other half, like the MLB and the NHL, I feel like dynasties are just dying out. And I just like that there's a new story every single season, a new cup winner, a new World Series winner, almost every single season. It's like it's cool to see a dynasty because they're like, they were a thing of the past. And like with the NHL, also the MLB dynasties happened like in the 90s and all that stuff. Like I like to see that the NBA and the NFL, they still have teams that can do that. I just feel like, in a whole, I feel like dynasties are just dying out. And I just like the, a story factor that it's just a new team, brand new team every single season. You really don't see the same teams going to the finals in, like, hockey or baseball. You really see the same teams going to, like, the Super Bowl or the NBA Finals, like, in the consistent spurts of seasons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know exactly where you're coming from. I... I guess I'm... Once again, it's in the right now mode, and I'm falling into it. Because last year... As much as I love LeBron making it to the finals, I was so pumped. That was the worst NBA finals ever. It really was. That was the worst NBA finals ever. This year, I guess I'm just I'm, I'm loving it because it's refreshed. And I will say the first three years, though, of it being the same teams with the, with the Warriors and the Cavs, it was games where, I mean, they blew a 3-1 series lead. LeBron with the block. That was iconic. That Warriors-Cavs finals going down is one of the most historic NBA finals game ever ever with Kyrie Irving hitting the game seven shot and all of it. So I I think the first three years were great. And then the fourth time they met, it was so overmatched. I know what you're saying though. It's okay. The Warriors again. Okay. The Warriors again, as much as I'm a fan, you shouldn't be able to root. Who's got you. Vegas should never have this spread. The Warriors or anybody else. You won't find that in hockey. You won't find that in, in baseball. You might find that in football, but you know what? This Patriots run is such an outlier. You can't really compare it to other dynasties. I, I mean, really, you can. It, it's so out there in comparison. There were other dynasties in football, but to this extreme, not really. So I, I don't know how far dynasties really go. When you say dynasties, you don't see teams make back-to-back in football. So really, when you do break it down, you're right. It might only be basketball. And it's not that I hate it. I, I I get your point, though. Let's just go with that. I understand your point with hockey, new storylines, you know, Vegas versus Caps last year. This year, it's Blues versus Bruins. And, and, I've, and you know this. I've hated the NHL playoffs all playoff long. But this series, 
I'm loving it, and I know I I I know that the Blues can compete. Yeah. Not that we're supposed to get into a Stanley Cup final debate here, but I was just curious on on how you saw things in regards to the NBA Finals. And do you, but do you, as a fan, real briefly here before we we close up shop, do you feel that that giddy feeling watching the NBA Finals, or do you not get that because you're such a hockey fan? I mean, I I do feel that I would be more excited if it were the Sixers say at least because I'm more yeah. of a die I'm more of a diehard Sixers fan than I would say the rest of the NBA. But it's still it's still exciting to watch, like because it's more exciting to me that Toronto made the finals this year and you don't see LeBron James and you get Golden State finally has a new competition in the finals. It, it makes it more of a better storyline than just say, oh, Clap Cavaliers, Golden State again. Oh, the Warriors are going to win again. Big deal. Yeah. To me. No, I, I absolutely see that mindset. So with that being said, I thought that was uh, that was awesome. You, you did a great job stepping in for the cousin who's relaxing in the Bahamas right now while I have some now warm coffee or not warm i'm sorry okay if it was warm it'd be drink it, soon it, to be, it's, uh, yeah it's I'm, I'm gonna have to add more to it to make it hot or soon to be orange juice with extra pulp no nah, i don't as much as i say i like it i couldn't even tell you the last time i've had it like three years ago i don't know too much pulp talk today i'll go send you a picture when i go downstairs i'll go send you the freaking whole jug of orange juice that i have without pulp ew i still like that too though anyway thank you guys so much for listening we are going to have more conversations throughout this NBA Finals, more podcasts. I think we're going to run with post days, so the days after the NBA Finals, with a nice podcast on top of a 10-minute recap. I think there will be some nice value with that. The, the podcasts have been doing pretty damn well, to be honest with you. It has some love after the first three episodes. I am love doing it because, you know, I can ramble for more than just 10 minutes about sports. I promise you that, and I, and I like this method a little bit more, so... Thank you so much for coming on this episode. I appreciate it. You did a hell of a job. Thanks. I was glad to do it. I hope there will be many opportunities in the future to do well with you. Absolutely, so. there will be. Thank you guys so much for listening, and I will see you next time.